गुड इवनिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन थैंक यू इंडिया फाउंडेशन राम माधव जी फॉर हैविंग मी हेयर आई ट्राई टू कीप दिस लेस देन टेन मिनट्स यू नो लास्ट इवनिंग इफ यू आर हेयर वी हैड अदर एंगेजिंग कॉन्वर्सेशन ऑन द राइट परस्पेक्टिव एंड द यूथ आई वॉन्ट टू टच अपॉन दैट अबेट वॉट इफ यू वेर टू ब्रॉड बेज द आर्ग्यूमेंट यू नो मेक द कैपिटल आर स्मॉल आर द राइट परस्पेक्टिव एज इन द करेक्ट परस्पेक्टिव एंड इंक्लूड नॉट जस्ट द यूथ but just about everybody where do we stand this is where we stand some of us write fat books very few people read them and we get most of our information from social media from twitter from whatsapp every once in a while those information also enlightens us uh, i'm a journalist so i'm always on twitter and uh, when i see erudite the erudite and the educated engaging on serious debates i read with interest one such uh, incident happened a few weeks ago when the foreign minister mr jay shankar wrote about a book he had read and a book event he had attended uh the book is about a new biography of vp menon uh which said that jawaharlal nehru had excluded sardar patel from the first cabinet it, it was a it, it was quite an interesting thing to read so i looked on to see how the comments would come this is what jay shankar tweeted and i quote learned from the book that nehru did not want patel in the cabinet in 1947 and omitted him from the initial cabinet list clearly a subject for much debate noted that the author stood her ground on this revelation note the words clearly a matter for much debate this is all shri jay shankar wrote soon Ramchandra Guha historian joined the debate and this is how he chose to word his argument on twitter besides promoting fake news about and false rivalries between the builders of modern india is not the job of the foreign minister he should leave this to the bjp's it cell guha wrote jay shankar responded to guha's criticism with a simple tweet saying some foreign ministers do read books the book in question was narayani basu's the unsung architect of modern india now i was a bit puzzled i mean here are two very erudite men and uh, one person is a foreign minister and he has tweeted about a book and the other person is a very noted historian why would he choose to word his argument in such manner the exchange of tweets reminded me of a year ago when my book came out it was a book of it was it's a book on oral history uh it's called blood island an oral history of the morijhapi massacre when the book came out obviously there was some buzz on twitter and cpm's mohammad salim very respectable gentleman he said that it's a this book is a book of lies such a thing has never happened and this is the right wing's conspiracy theory every time the election comes now the factually uh, the first inaccuracy was the election had already happened modi government was in power again and uh, by a very wide uh, stretch of imagination the left was not in contention to form any kind of government so how a right uh, conspiracy to bring down the left uh, at this time uh, would come up I, i had no clue but what was my book about and why did mohammad salim reply the way he did which reminded me of the conversation of the of the sort of spat between shri jay shankar and ramchandra guha My book is about an incident that happened 40 years ago in an uninhabited island called Morichappi the island still stands but it's again uninhabited where around 10000 namoshudros dalits uh from east pakistan which is now bangladesh had assembled they wanted to find make a home for themselves and they had escaped riots uh severe riots in 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 bangladesh and come here and they were promised by the left left parties which were then in opposition that once they are in power they will be settled in bengal uh they hold on to that promise this band of men and women refugees and they spend decades sort of doing manual labor and saving money in the hope that some day the left would come to power and they would be given a place to stay within bengal When the left did come to power in 1977, uh, representatives of these refugees went to meet Jyoti Basu, then Chief Minister, and reminded him that you know he was that they, he had made a promise to them. 
Jyotibasu said, no, nothing doing. I don't remember this promise. And uh, sorry, you have to make do with what you have and where you, where you live. So this really agitated them. And they found out a little island in the Sundarbans where they, on their own accord, they settled down. And they sort of, over a period of six months or so, built huts, built a school, built salt pans, built a boat manufacturing unit, and, you know, started life afresh. This angered left from so much that they ordered these islanders to leave. But these people were adamant. They had spent decades in turmoil. So they said, We'd, we won't leave because there's nothing in the island and we are not taking a penny from the government. Why will we leave? So there was an economic blockade sometime in December 1978. For, for, for 15 days, police launches surrounded the island and stopped the islanders from fetching food, water, and other necessities from the nearby islands. A lot of children died, women died during those few 15 days of economic blockade. And then through a PIL, the blockade was lifted. And that's when the horror started, real horror started. Uh, police were sent, gangs were sent, women were raped, men were shot. And between January and May 1979, something around 10,000, 10,000, the number varies, of course, refugees were killed in Marijapi. It is by far independent India's worst pogrom, if you go by the sheer scale of the massacre, the numbers, 10,000, 7 to 10,000. Yet, when you look at our history books, or when you look at our newspapers, if you Google Morijapi, you will hardly find anything, any mention. Some work has been done in foreign universities. But in India, there's hardly any mention of Morijapi massacre. How did this, why did this happen? Why would a massacre happen in 78, 79 and nobody would come to know of it or no books would be written, uh, newspapers won't report it? Because the left and government clamped down and the left ecosystem, which we now say the ecosystem, they made sure that no books are published, no record is kept. And even many, many years later, when somebody somewhere would want to talk about it, he would be shouted down. Uh, 40 years later, when I started research on the book and I fi found out survivors and I moved from state to state, I even went to Bangladesh where some of the refugees had gone back to, to record their history and tell their story. Mm, I came across, uh, I won't take the name of course, but a very big pub publisher in Delhi who said, look, it's a great story, but can you not mention the left? Can you just tell the story without mentioning the left? So I said, but if there's no left, there's no story because left is a story. So fi finally, uh, I managed to get a publisher and I managed to tell the story more or less the way I wanted to say. And when the book came out, like I said, Mohammed Salim and several of my friends, childhood friends, friends I've gone to school with, college with, they unfriended me on Facebook, DM'd me on Twitter, unfollowed me on Twitter saying that, how can you do this? So I said, but you know, while I was researching the book five long years, we have discussed this and you also know you're from Bengal, you know this happened. He said, yeah, but to bring it out like this, at a time like this, you know, the Modi government is in power, they'll use it against us, and bigger things are happening. I said, I'm sure bigger things are happening, and they need to, those stories need to be told too. But this is a story I have invested so much time in, it's a great story, nobody has told it. So I said, no, no, I mean, this story, should, I mean, you should not have brought out the book. I am I'm narrating this story, the story of my book and the story of Morishabi Massacre, because it reminded me of the way Ramachandra Guha reacted to Sri Jai Shankar's tweet. You may not agree with the book on VP Menon where it's mentioned that Nehru did not want Patel in the first cabinet, but it does invite you, a book which is well researched, does invite you to a debate. You want, don't want to have the debate, so you want to infantilize, shout down, disregard any other, the, an opposing point of view. And this is the crux of the matter. For way too long, we have had one kind of narrative. If you look at uh, the, how we read India, how we present India, we had who, who spoke to us about India? Our British colonizers. We know about India, our Indian history through British colonizers. Post that for a very long period of time, for decades, you have the left historians interpreting history for us. Then you had a period, very short period, and continues where you had the subaltern gaze, you know, where the subaltern look at things, how the subaltern uh, sort of want to interpret what's happening around them. And now you of course have the right, some bit of work from the right side of things. My point is how difficult is it
to just say it the way it is, how difficult it is to just go out there, see what you see, uh, come back and report or come back and write books. It's obviously very difficult because most of us don't seem to be able to do that. Uh, which is where I think telling India, telling the India story has become so important now. And I think there's a simple, I'm a, I've been a career journalist, I think there's a simple way of doing it. You know, when you, when you taste food, when you taste any new food, they say you need to clean the palate, whatever food it is, even if it's my friend Anand Ranganathan's Mysore Park, you need to first clean the palate. If you have a lingering taste of, of some, something you've had before, you won't be able to enjoy new food. Likewise, if you need to report on something, you need to rid your mind of biases, any kind of bias, and go with an open mind and report. I think if we can do that, that's a start. This is continuing the debate last night. I think if we can do that, if we can do the simple exercise of, exercise of simply telling the story the way we see it without any kind of bias, which is difficult of course, I think we can reach out to more and more people and really retell the India story. Thank you.